back, everybody, to another episode of The Nonprofit Show. We're super excited that you are here today with us. I'm Julia C. Patrick, CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy. Been joined today by one of the super cool masterminds of your part-time controller, Tanya Paul, a regional director for the nation's largest um, uh, nonprofit accounting firm. Well, excuse me. But what would you, how do you say this, Tanya? Not accounting firm, but financial services or bookkeeping? How no, do you, I mean, nonprofit uh, accounting services okay. is what okay. we sure. provide, accounting and financial reporting services. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Well, I, you know, after, after all that, I didn't want to get it wrong. <laughs> so I had to like make sure I was correcting myself. This is a cool conversation. And before we get into it, um, the, the title of this episode is What's Around the Corner for Nonprofits. And I'm going to tell you, Tanya, in my very early 20s, my first board I was I was uh, elected to, a CPA came and, and gave us, you know, the, the audit results. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I'm going to woman up and say I had no, I had no clue what he was saying. I was like, what the was hell? Have I, yeah. <laughs> I, was, I was so freaked out. And I mean, I was practically perspiring, just like, oh my God, I'm, how could I be a leader? And he must've seen my face because he, he looked at me and then he addressed the board and he said, I'm not asking you to figure out what all these numbers mean. Right. The biggest thing that you can do as a successful steward of this nonprofit is understand the trend lines. Mm -hmm. Because if you understand the trend lines and if you can see what's around the corner, you're going to be successful. And I, I'm telling you, I have held that in my heart for 30 plus years, right? Yep. So this is a cool conversation. Um, and so before we get to this conversation, I want to make sure that we talk about our presenting sponsors, because they've been that through line for us. Um, and they include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, your part-time controller, our new episode on Fridays called Fundraisers Friday, which is super fun, super cool. You got to check it out. And then 180 Management Group. But more importantly, we have built this new cadre of co-hosts. They come from all over the country. They represent different parts of the sector. They do different things. Um, I'm flying solo today with Tanya because I was so really interested in what she had to say that I wanted her all to myself. <laughs> but anyway, I hope you've uh, really been able to meet them because they're super cool people and they just um, bring a wealth of knowledge. Okay, Tanya Paul, Regional Director, your part-time controller, my friend, because you have that glowing star of Texas behind you. <laughs> what well, gives <you> away? <laughs> tell us where you are from. Um, I am based in Houston, Texas, um, and I've been here in Texas for the second half of my life. Um, you know, uh, they say I wasn't born here, but I got here as fast as I could. Um, <laughs> um, and I've been with YPTC for six and a half years. I used to be the director for the Houston market, um, been in the regional director capacity since last year. Um, and I'm in charge of all the states between Louisiana all the way up to Washington state on all the border states, basically, um, helping to manage existing offices as well as opening new offices for YPTC. Amazing. So your part-time controller, talk to us really briefly because we've got so many questions for you. If you're, let's say, a small to medium-sized nonprofit, what does your work and your engagement look like? Yeah. So, um, you know, it, our kind of uh, uh, bread and butter client, if you will, um, can be anywhere from half a million to a million on the smaller side, all the way up to 15, 20 million. Although we have clients beyond that range as well. Yeah. Um, and it can be anything as simple as we just come in at month end, 
do a full cycle close um, of the books, review, reconcile, make sure everything's properly recorded, and then prepare financials, do analysis, go to the board meeting with, with the ED, help explain the numbers, the trends, like you were explaining, you know, <laughs> in, in common English, not in accounting speak, um, and, um, you know, help them understand where the organization is and where the organization might be heading, good, bad, the ugly, all of that. Um, in a larger organization, we may even help with kind of the day-to-day -day functions um, as the accounting complexity in increases with the size and type of organization they might be. Cool. Okay. Thank you for sharing that because you know what, as much as I know, uh, um, you know, I work with our friends at YPTC and you, usually when we have you on, we have so many questions and that we just like stream steamroll into those questions. And so thank you for taking a deep breath, stepping back and then kind of painting the picture as to what you and your amazing team members do, um, because it's it's really, you know, an, an interesting thing about how, how fearful we are of numbers and accounting. And so I think a lot of times we just kind of push it off or yep. worse, we, we relegate it to those poor people in the back of the building underneath the dark windowless <laughs> offices, <laughs> right? The stereotypical yeah. bean counters. <laughs> Yeah, it's true. I hate to say it. I just, it reflects so poorly on our sector, but I kind of think it's true. But anyway, okay. Let's start off with one of these big trends, which I think is sometimes trends aren't pos positive, but this yay team increasing the value of trust philanthropy. What is this looking like? Yeah. So um, recently there was an article that came out by an organization called the Independent Sector. Um, they started doing this survey. Um, this is the fifth year they're doing this survey. Um, and it really they're really trying to measure trust in the nonprofit space. Um, what they do is they partner with Edelman Data and Intelligence. So anyone who deals with data anal analysis in the nonprofit sector is very fam familiar with Edelman. Um, and they did um, a survey of about 3,000 Americans, as well as they ran three different online discussion boards that with about 72 adults. Um, so they did some quantitative as well as qualitative analysis um, of people's perception of the nonprofit sector. Um, and they, again, reminder, this, this is their fourth year really focusing on this. So this is the fifth report coming out for that is really more focused on the nonprofit sector, if you will. Mm -hmm. You know, this is such a big concept because basically what it looks like is to a funder or a stakeholder or a donor of any size saying to the organization, I'm not going to put so many guardrails on my donation. Yes. I'm going to trust you as somebody boots on the ground to take my philanthropic investment and steward it appropriately. Yeah. Um, so if you read the article, actually, they, the very first sentence in the article is public trust is the currency of the nonprofit sector. So if you think about it, that's such a profound statement, right? It's not the dollars that that drive the nonprofit business, if you will. It's mm -hmm. that something that you can't even measure that easily, right? It's the trust between the public and the nonprofit organization to be able to steward that money and do the right thing for the community at large, mm -hmm. right? And um, out of this, uh, this study that came out, the survey that came out, um, what they found is over the course of the last four or five years, especially post pandemic, um, that trust has actually increased for nonprofits in general. Um, and so the, the study goes into a lot more nuance in terms of nonprofits versus general philanthropy from corporate and individuals and as well as foundations, but really looking at the 501c3, the traditional nonprofits that you and I kind of think about the lay person, mm -hmm. um, that actually jumped five percentage points in their survey this year versus last year, um, which says a lot about what people think nonprofits are capable of doing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it builds, it, it, it builds um, to me in my mind, one of the benefits is it's building investment. Yeah. People are saying, yeah, this is this is a, a better bet than doing something else. And yeah, so, yeah, cool. OK, so, let's go. 
I'm yeah, sorry. so I, before we jump off away from that, there's kind of a couple of key takeaways I want to make sure that we touch upon from that survey. Mm -hmm. um, what they said was there's three key takeaways. One was um, the responsibility, if you want to keep that trust and maintain that increase in trust in nonprofits, they need to see continued, the respondents need to see continued greater financial transparency, um, you know, being able to see their work, what are their impact, the ROI on donations, right? Um, and they can also want to increase their trust through a set of guidelines and ethical principles. What does that mean? Documented policies and procedures, right? Um, you know, showing that you are adhering to best practices of the sector, of whatever industry you're looking at, whether it's accounting or IT or whatever it might be. And then also respondents also have greater trust if they volunteered with a nonprofit because then they get a greater insight into what a nonprofit does and how um, impactful the volunteering, the money is to the community that it's serving. Love it. I think that's brilliant. I mean, no matter what you're doing, I think that's just a general best practice, right? Exactly. And, and and, and we don't need necessarily this reminder, but apparently we need this reminder, right? <laughs> you know, we shouldn't need it, but we need it. Okay, yeah. let's go on to this next thing, because I think this is a, a big thing that's been kind of simmering. Um, and we, we started seeing this with the concept of labor laws in terms yep. of internships and uh, in the nonprofit sector. Oh my goodness, you can hardly get through a college education without some sort of philanthropic piece of internship. And now it's bleeding off into overtime rules. What yep. is this looking like? Like what trend should we be looking at, at looking at around? Yes. So technically it is already law, if you will. Um, in, in April, the US Department of Labor, um, they had a final ruling and it's called defining and delimiting the exemption for executive administrative professional outside sales and computer employees. And their goal really was, the purpose of this was to restore and extend overtime pro protections for the working American. Um, and then also looking at redefining what highly compensated employees actually look like and what the, what's what duties test they must uh, satisfy. Gotcha. Um, and, and basically, um, without getting into a lot of detail, as of July 1st, there's two tranches. As of July 1st, um, they've raised the standard in, in terms of the number, the dollar amount, in terms of who qualifies as an exempt employee. And then in July, January of uh, 2025, January 1, there's going to be another increase on that exemption number. So what that means is, um, as of July 1, um, per Bloomberg law, um, the impact is that there's a million more workers who technically are eligible for overtime or a bump in their pay to meet that threshold. And as of January 1, they're estimating it could be almost 3.5 million uh, people who are impacted. And really, other than California and uh, Washington State and part of New York State, not all of New York State, um, would not be impacted because their laws are already um, higher than what the federal law is um, suggest, uh, not suggesting. Mm -hmm basically dictating at this point. Mm -hmm. um, and so as of July 1st, you should have already figured that out for your employees, gone through your payroll register and, you know, made those bumps or, you know, basically taking the hit and saying, yes, I'm going to just pay these people overtime going forward. Um, but also looking at the January 1 impact, because that's going to be another big uh, impact to your bottom line, if you will. Um, the only caveat to that is, you know, Texas, um, the state of Texas as the employer has actually filed suit um, against this law. Um, and even though there is a stay for just the state of Texas as an employer, not the entire state of Texas, um, they think that this is the only one of the several suits that have come forward um, that has some teeth to it. So you need to kind of watch for it because it could impact um, um, in the employer's favor um, mm -hmm. if, if this goes anywhere. And there, the basis for the Texas uh, suit is that um, the DOL went too far into the dollar amounts, like thinking about the dollar amounts and not actually the duties of what that employee wow. is performing. Um, so good. just again, we don't know what's going to happen, but I would prepare that this is in place and you better have the funds ready to pay um, these employees and have those conversations. Mm -hmm 
I would not prematurely have those conversations for January 1, but make sure that you're talking to your board members, your donors, make sure yeah. you have your coffers all ready to go if, if you need to make those adjustments. I love that um, we, we added this for around the corner trends, because I think a lot of organizations are like, we can skirt this with volunteers and or we can like kind of test volunteers and then, you know, offer them a job. And, you know, so there are a lot of shenanigans going around. So yeah. thank you for kind of uh, pulling that up to something that we need to be looking at. OK, this is the next thing that, again, can kind of get our panties in a twist. Updated <laughs> IRS uniform guidance rules. Ooh, yeah, that's just sounds frightening. Yeah. So um, not nearly as frightening. Um, if you're in the nonprofit space and you get federal funding, then you know what uniform guidance rules are. Mm -hmm. um, and based on those uniform guidance rules, you pr may or may not have to fought, you know, do a single audit, which basically looks at your financial information as well as your internal controls, right? Um, and so in a very like quick kind of summary way, um, they've done a couple of things in this, um, in this update. They've increased the threshold for that audit from 750k to a million um okay you know if i had to venture a guess um one of those reasons is because of all the covid funding that came in it actually surprised a lot of nonprofits into that threshold right um so yeah. you know they're making some adjustments for that um also like costs of things are going up as well right so that's probably another reason for increasing this threshold mm -hmm. the second thing that is changing is the de minimis rate increases from 10% to 15%. To 15 right. So that's a big adjustment. Um, so de minimis rate is basically that cost allocation piece. So if you're a smaller organization, you may not ask for, you know, you may just adopt, elect to adopt the, the, the base rate versus going through a whole NICRA calculation and agreement process with the organizations. Um, the third piece is um, modified total direct costs. Um, so the definition there is changing. So what that means is if you get federal funding and then you also use a subrecipient to do some of the work, um, it used to be that $25,000 was the cap. They've doubled that to cap to 50 k during the life of that award. Um, and then also there's um, improvement in notice uh, funding opportunities. So more clear, plain layman's language. There needs to be an executive summary to explain the goal or objective of a potential funding opportunity. And then the last piece is increased advocacy efforts. They're, they're changing some of the practices where you know, if an awardee has issues with the, um, you know, the NICRA calculation or anything like that, they have, there's, they're creating a, a more transparent process to be able to file a complaint or a hearing or if you will. Wow. You know, it sounds like it's a, it's been a pretty big jump of change. Is that, is that fair? Yeah, to say? I mean, these are, these are big changes. I mean, these, yeah. these you yeah. know, the first one alone can, you know, organizations that were in the book bucket before and needed an audit may no longer need an audit. Yeah. You know how much an audit costs? That's a that's a big chunk of change that you all of a sudden have that you don't need for an audit anymore, right? Yeah. Um, I wouldn't go spend it. I would put it in your rainy day bucket, but... <laughs> <laughs> um, spoken but, you know. like a true accountant spoken <laughs> like a true accountant and we appreciate that Tanya we appreciate that yeah I think this is really interesting because to me when I start first started hearing about these changes um, it's kind of like all of the things that have gone on because of COVID and funding which we're going to talk about next um, really is kind of blood through right this isn't just a oh we do this every five years I, I feel like a lot of these changes are because our ecosystem has changed, right? Yeah, 100%. And, and, and just revisiting a lot of these things because of the impact during COVID. Good, bad, ugly, all of it. Right, right, right. It's not punitive as much as it seems to me like it's um, it's reasonable, yeah. right? Like, like there's some thought process here um, to, as to what's going on. So Let's talk about this. One of the most interesting things that's happened, I think, to the nonprofit sector, especially in terms of uh, fundraising, asset exchange, dealing with crypto assets. Dun, yeah. dun, dun, dun. Okay, what is this going to look like? Yeah, this is like the Wild West, right? Yeah. Um, this is like the modern Wild West. Um, yeah. So to give a little bit of history, um, the first recorded crypto donation actually is 
only as recently as 2017. Um, it was an anonymous donor um, who, known only as the Pineapple Fund. They never figured out who it was, uh, who or how many people were part of that fund, but they donated Bitcoins that were worth $55 million in 2017 to 60 different charities. Um, so that's where the door basically, if you will, got blown wide open in this conversation. And that's why it's a trend that we're talking about today. Um, if you look at it since then, um, you know, the last data I found, data point I found was the giving block said that, um, you know, the value of cryptocurrency donations since then has grown up to 300 million annually, right? And then they are also saying that um, the crypto philanthropy uh, organization, they're saying that they're forecasting that this space of donations is going to grow to $10 billion over the next 10 years. Um, and so that's that's a big component of a revenue source. So that's why I thought it would be really interesting to bring this as a trend because there's actually legislation coming um, or attempts at legislation coming to put some <laughs> real framework around cryptocurrency, the definitions, how it should be regulated, um, you know, how it should be defined, who should be regulating it is also up for debate. Um, so there is a um, the one that seems to have the most traction right now um, in May, um, the House actually passed um, what they're calling a historic crypto bill, and it's called the Financial Innovation and Technology for the 21st Century Act. Um, now, there's mixed reviews on the street of whether the Senate will pass it or not. It seems to be a bipartisan um, effort. But we'll, it remains to be seen what's going to happen on the Senate side. Um, but the really big thing is not only creating a tailored disclosure and registration regime um, for these digital asset companies, they're also shifting, they want to shift that primary uh, oversight responsibility from um, the SEC to mm -hmm. the, the F Commodity Futures Trading Commission. So, um, so you know, that that alone just sounds political, right? Like you know, when somebody is losing, you know, oversight versus somebody gaining oversight. Um, but you know, there's real um, importance here for why nonprofits should look at this because there's pros and cons to why you would want to um, touch crypto as a uh, a donation revenue source or why you might go after it. Um, some of the pros are. Um, you're going to attract new demographics, right? People who are playing yep. in the crypto space are younger, right? Younger. It's the next generation. If you're thinking about your donor pipeline, you've got to think about the next generation. And mm -hmm. you know, this is a great way to attract new donors. Mm -hmm. um, it creates significant tax perks for the donors. Um, so people who are making that kind of money in the crypto space, um, they're looking for tax um, advantages and donation is one way. Um, the other one, as I started out with this section, anonymous gifting. There's no way to track somebody down and figure out who gave it if they don't want to be found, right? <laughs> blockchain, um, baby. Yeah. yeah. And then you just took the word right out of my mind. Blockchain. Blockchain yeah. creates donation security as well, like being able to track that funding. Mm -hmm. um, but there's also downsides to it. So things you need to be aware of when you're thinking about accepting crypto as a donation. Um, the anonymity of donors doesn't allow for you to build relationships with those donors. Mm -hmm. right? There's no way for you to communicate with them. There's no way for you to track them down. Um, so it could be a one and done thing and you'll never know. Right. Um, there's also potential reputational risk because if it does come to light that the donor is somebody with questionable ethics or morality um, that you don't want your organization to be affiliated with. It may not even be you. Your board may not want to be affiliated with or yeah. your, your big funders may not be want to be affiliated with. So that could create some reputational risks. And then the biggest thing that I just talked about, the, it's a wild west right now. There's not real strong legislation around there. there. It's coming. So that could change the landscape in terms of how nonprofits are able to or not able to accept crypto um, and what the risk could change for a nonprofit. I think this is, is just a fascinating conversation. <laughs> um, it's still, we're in, like, you, I love that you said the Wild West um, because I feel like that's, you say that and everybody understands. Yeah, <laughs> uh, we're you know we're in this roller coaster, right? I mean, it yep. seems like it fell off the the you know radar because it had dropped in value. Now it's gone back up. I mean, hence the roller coaster ride. So 
yeah, a trend line that we definitely need to be looking at. Okay, we don't have a lot of time left, but this one is is somewhat, it saddens me, it frightens me. Nonprofits closing doing to COVID funding ending. And you yeah. have some late breaking news on this as well. Talk to us yeah. about this, Tanya. Yeah, so I'll give you the 30 second of what I was gonna say until the late breaking news. Um, so think about all the things that nonprofits were challenged with before we went into COVID and then all the things that have exacerbated since COVID, right? Labor shortages, cost of labor increasing, right? Overtime rules, right? Um, inflation, um, donors either having still continued hesitancy or returning to pre-pandemic donation habits or even less as they have job insecurity, right? Um, overall rising cost of everything. Um, we haven't really talked about cyber threats because that's threatening everyone, not just the nonprofit space. Um, and then, you know, just and all of that even resulting in burnout, right? Leadership burnout. So if you think about all these things, um, nonprofits that are not really strategic, not building plans, not looking at scenario analysis, um, not thinking about diversifying their revenue source, their donor base, you kind of have to hit all the things all the time almost um, to make sure your nonprofit's steering in the right direction. And you might be tempted to think that this is only impacting small nonprofits or nonprofits that are, you know, less than a million dollars, half a million dollars, right. you know, whatever. But no, the late breaking news is we have another organization um, that Mackenzie Scott actually you know, donated $20 million to, and they are folding. Um, so if you get a subscription to uh, philanthropy.com, mm -hmm. just about an hour and a half ago, they sent out an article um, about an organization called Benefits Data Trust, who works in the AI space, the nonprofit tech world, um, got $20 million. And if you read through the article, they got $7 million from other, you know, foundations. This was from the outside looking in, looked like a really robust, healthy, successful go-getter nonprofit, but um, really they didn't make some hard decisions. They were not strategic in their growth. They were not strategic in cost cutting or actually analyzing their costs even, right? Um, and really setting themselves up in a strategic growth mode versus just, hey, we'll just take the money and figure it out mode, right? So um, this, this, Nonprofits going out of business can be at all levels. So, you know, you've got to have great leadership at the top. Right. I, I love, I, I hate that you brought that up, but I love that you brought that up because I think a lot of times as a smaller nonprofit or mid-sized nonprofit, we are just like one score away from being, you know, like just not having any cares, right? Yeah. But that is not a strategy, nor is it reality. And so what an incredible message to us all to, to remember this story, because, you know, um, that, as you said, that additional 7 million, I mean, that endorsement by that, you know, uh, incredible gift had to attract so much other attention, so much other investment, so many other stakeholders knocking at the door. And so this is not the the great, you know, uh, key to success that we all think without money is not the money is not the solution to everything, right? It's how you steward that money is is just as important, right? Wow, Tanya Paul, I always love chatting with you. I think you're just such a great, I think you're just such a great mind, right? And so <laughs> it's really fun to chat with you. Um, I love your temperament, and that is, I feel like I can ask you questions. And your your hair's not gonna you know combust and and you're gonna be like oh my god you know the sky is falling um, and I I think that's I might really feel that internally but I won't <laughs> I won't pass that on to you <laughs> oh my god the truth is out the truth is out no really I I have to witness that to you because I think that's what that's where we that's where we become more fearful, right? When yeah. we're afraid to, to be vulnerable and ask questions, and especially in on the board level where you're like high functioning and successful in your workaday world over there, but then you come back to the nonprofit sector and you're like, oh my God, I don't know. And yeah. yet I should know and all this. It's so frightening. And, and you know, um, in leadership, 
whether it be board or C-suite, you know this is important. You know that this is your responsibility. And so how do you give voice to that and get clarity? Um, and I love, Tanya, that you chose to talk about trends. Yeah. So we don't necessarily need to know the, the nuts and bolts, but we sure as heck need to know the trends so that we can figure out what we have to be watching and educating ourselves with. Yeah. So. And not all of these are going to apply to every single nonprofit, right? So you right. have to know what applies to your organization. Right. And again, how, which trend should you be watching the through line yeah. on? So yeah. yeah, Tanya Paul, regional director, your part-time controller from the great state of Texas. Uh, my favorite Texas line that I kind of live by is um, the higher the hair, the closer to God. <laughs> Texas says that's from, that's, that's from the Dallas area. I went to high school in Fort Worth. So. <laughs> oh my God! Well, Texas, I, you know our guests that come on. I, from I do have a little bit of a poop going today. <laughs> Yeah, you have. I mean, yeah, you have to. But I think our friends from Texas, they always have great lines and uh, we appreciate them. I, I really do believe that. Tanya Paul, again, regional director from your part time controller. Check out YPTC.com. They have tons of content, free content. You don't have to be one of their clients to gain access to it. Um, and there are no paywalls. And, and there's just Always, always, always right on top. Um, like Tanya broke some, you know, late break, break, breaking news this morning with us, right? So this is what you can expect from YPTC.com. Um, again, we want to thank our, our amazing presenting sponsors, Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Your Part-Time Controller, Fundraisers Friday, our new episodes on Friday, and 180 Management Group. These are the folks that stay connected with us so that we can be connected with you. Hey, Tanya, you know, every, you've been on before and you know that we end every episode with this mantra and it goes like this, to stay well so you can do well. Yes. Thank you, Tanya.